Sir Silverthorne had a blue tunic that under his armor he wore. It bore all the brunt of his fighting, and many blows suffered full sore. Uh, for many years he had worn it, it never had, for many years he had worn it, and it never had needed a wash. If it ever grew stiff or fragrant, he'd just beat it until it was soft. It was Silverthorne's blue fighting tunic that we recall to mind. Sir Silverthorne's blue fighting tunic. The one that was left behind. <clears throat> it was after a practice one Wednesday when a great knight unpacked his bag. He had gathered his kit in a hurry and haste to saddle his nag. His blue fighting tunic was missing. He searched, but it could not be found. Sir Silverthorne was not forgetful. He'd never lost hawk nor hound. The tunic was wrapped in a bundle back at the practice hall the place where the populace gathers each week to answer the call. It lay alone in a corner, forgotten behind a chair, until a silvery shaft of moonlight illuminated it there. The tunic glowed in the moonlight. It seemed to shimmer and shift. And then, in the silence, it quivered. And then it began to lift. The tunic arose in the moonlight, and there it slowly unrolled. It turned to its left, and then to its right. And then it went out for a stroll. <laughs> what magic was moonlight making that thus animated a shirt? It was only an old fighting tunic, encrusted with sweat and with dirt. Uh, but this was Silverthorne's tunic. <laughs> which at long, at last, at length, had become saturated with power, with pungent prowess and strength. The tunic sailed through the city and flapped like a proud battle flag. It was seeing these sights for the first time. It was usually stuffed in a bag. It came to the banks of a river, a river that twists and turns, a great river for a great city, a river that occasionally burns. <laughs> the tunic stood there in wonder amidst all the ships and the cranes, for the tunic had never seen water. <laughs> Except as occasionally rain. The tunic stood there and wondered what would happen if it went for a swim. The tunic was ripe for adventure. So the tunic dove in. You might think our story would end there. That the magic would all wash away. The tunic would float down the river. And I'd have naught else to say. This was the Crooked River, a river of fire and ice. And there are things in the Crooked River, things not noble, not nice. <laughs> the dark current savaged the tunic till its goodness was utterly spent. The tunic now twisted in evil on mayhem and pillage was bent. It boarded a merchant vessel by climbing the anchor chain, it flung itself at a crewman who shrieked in terror and pain. He called out for aid to his shipmates. They rushed to his side, but then this was Silverthorne's tunic, and it had the strength of ten men. One crusty old salt saw the carnage, and he knew how to settle the score, for he had once been a fighter. Why, he'd served on the Carrig Moor, that great floating shire of legend that sailed the seven seas with nuclear tip rattan weapons and pennons on the flight deck's breeze. <laughs> he ran below decks to the laundry. <laughs> and you know what happened next. One cupful of soap, and that tunic collapsed in a heap on the deck. <laughs> and thus ends the tale of the tunic that briefly knew its own mind. Sir Silverthorne's blue fighting tunic, the one 
that was left behind.